Dear family in Christ, may God's grace and peace be with you. May He strengthen you with the knowledge that His salvation is so great that it is greater than this creation. Please join me in prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, we give thanks to you for each new day that you bless us. We thank you for the beauty of your creation that surrounds us. We thank you, Lord, that even amidst this great creation, beyond our, our imagination, that you care for us, that you love us, that you, we are so important, that you even know the count of hairs or lack of hairs upon our head. We pray, Lord, that every day that we would praise you, that we praise you in what we say and what we do, that we would lift up voices wherever we may be to honor your name. In all things we pray through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Dotted throughout the countryside of Europe, as at least so I'm told, there are many cathedrals that have been built by the hands of parishioners. Parishioners who, who thought it worth their time and their energy to put it into building these great places of worship to their Lord. Now I'm told that as you go into a cathedral, that there is a specific architecture that as you look at a cathedral, it's the largest building in town that you can, from the outside, you can see it from a distance so that your eyes are always drawn to the Lord. When you go in, the ceilings are so high that you look up intentionally to look up at the worship of your Lord. And even our own church shares that same design, doesn't it? When we enter into the church, we realize just how high the ceiling is. We're drawn up to look, to look at the above us. To realize it is not all about us, but our worship as we come together each time to praise is to God, our great God. Another thing about cathedrals, even about our own church, we realize how small we are. How small we are compared to the greatness of our God. As we look up above our, our altar, we see the stained glass that reminds us of what Jesus did for us, for you and for me, giving his own body and blood, sacrificing himself as we prepare to go out into our community, into our world, our eyes are drawn up to the revelation window where we cannot help but look up and see the King who not only reigns here in our church, but reigns throughout the world. It's kind of amazing, isn't it, when you think about it, that even simple architecture can lead us to worship God, can lead us to look up, to look up at who we are worshiping, to know that God is greater and bigger. There's an author by the name of J.B. Phillips. And in 1952, he wrote a book called Your God is Too Small. Now, J.B. Phillips in this book, is, he was trying to encourage people to see God as more than just a God you can fit into a box that you can shape and form and make him your own way. He didn't want you to just see God as that grandfather type that you can go sit on his knee and be okay. He didn't want you to see God as just that, he, that ruler who was unapproachable. But he wanted you to see God as the God of all creation. So throughout his book, he continued to paint pictures of the greatness of God and, and the ways that God has done amazing things. And think about it for a minute. When you think about who God is, because when we stop to think about who God is, we realize he's the God who spoke us into motion. He's the God who spoke you into being. He's the one who spoke an electron to go traveling into a molecule, even though we can't see it without a microscope. God made that design. He's the God who, who made waves crash against seashores and wind rattle the leaves of wheat and corn. He's the God who led us to be able to raise our hands in beautiful ways, to move our hands, to move our arms, our bodies in honor to him. He's the God who's above all. And in Psalm 96, we're led to praise him. In Psalm 96, the psalmist encourages, and I encourage you to turn back to that psalm. We're not going to treat the whole thing in the sermon today, but I want you guys to read through it and take some time this week to read through it. But I want to look at those first three verses again because the psalmist not only encourages us to praise, but for all creation. From the top here, it says, Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise His name, proclaim His salvation day after day. Declare His glory among the nations. His marvelous deeds among all peoples. Not just us, but all of creation is meant to praise God. The wind and the waves, the mountains and the trees, even stones are meant to praise God. And this can be a little confusing for us because sometimes we, we limit the praise of God to just when we're in the sanctuary, just when we're standing right here together, when we're in the house of the Lord. But when God talks about praise, when the psalmist talks about praise in Psalm 96, 
He's talking about praise that is in everything we say and everything we do. He's talking about praise that means when we go out into the world and we live our lives. And that's why praise is not limited only by singing a couple words to a hymn or praying, uh, praying from, from the Bible. But it's in how we live as the people of God, carrying out our vocations as his sons and daughters. It's interesting because when we think about the praise of creation, when we think about how creation honors God, sometimes it's not what we would expect. Sometimes it's not what we would imagine. There's an author by the name of that is by Dallas Willard who wrote a book, The Divine Conspiracy. And in this book, he's, he, by the way, he's a philosopher, and he, he looked at the way that we celebrate creation, the things that bring us joy, the things that make us just amazed at God's hand. And he said, with the way we feel, imagine how God must feel. See, we see everything from our small point of view, but God sees everything at once. Just a couple weeks ago, we went to the Grand Canyon, and some of you have been there, maybe some of you haven't, but I want you to think about the most memorable moment you've had when you've been out in God's creation. When we went out to the Grand Canyon, and I got to the edge, it was breathtaking. In fact, for a minute, I was speechless, and if you can believe it, I was speechless, just looking over God's creation. Maybe you guys have had the same feeling before. You've looked over God's creation and you've seen the immensity and the enormity. Maybe not at the Grand Canyon. Maybe it was waves crashing on a beach. Maybe it was just standing amidst the trees in a forest or looking out at a sunset. But in all those things, imagine how you feel. Now think about how God must feel. He must be the joyous being in all creation. Da Dallas Willard said that, not me, but the idea that he must be the, gr the most joyous because he sees everything. We hear music. He hears all the voices of creation singing together. We see beauty. He sees the beauty of creation across the entire earth. It's amazing, isn't it? Because creation, when it's doing what it's supposed to, when we do what we're supposed to do, when we live as God's children, honoring him and obeying him, when creation, when the winds obey him, when the waves obey him as they're supposed to, think about the beauty it creates. Think about the joy it must bring to the Creator. Parents, you kind of can get a little understanding of this. Because as you look at your children, your procreation with, with God, you see the joy that your children bring you. Now imagine the joy that God must have in all of us. Except for one thing. So often in creation, there's ugliness and brokenness. So often throughout creation, it's been polluted and destroyed by those who he has created. God has given us this beautiful earth, this wonderful place to live, to praise him. We've raped the forests. We've hunted the animals to extinction. We've brought ugliness to what God has made beautiful. When we were returning from Flagstaff, because that's where we stayed, it snowed for much of the first part of our, our drive. And I don't know if you guys have seen a fresh snow before. Some of you have, some of you may haven't, maybe haven't. But when there's a fresh snow, and you look out over the fresh snow, it's just beautiful. It's all white. It's untouched. But as we were driving home, so quickly, that white snow, it turned from that beautiful white to brown and black and gray. And it was nasty and disgusting because the plow trucks had come through, because other cars had come through. How quickly that happened. Now, don't get me wrong, I was thankful for the plow trucks, but it made me realize how fast the beauty of God's creation can be destroyed. How fast that beauty can be wiped away. How easy it is for creation to be silenced. How many animals hide and cower in fear? Think about back to the original creation. Back to the beginning, God created that man could actually name the animals, that they could come to him Isaiah gives us a picture of a child being able to, to, be, with, be, to be with a lion to, for, 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 uh, to reach into the hole of a snake. I mean, you think about these things, and that was what God created, and now what has it become? The ugliness that has been replaced, the silence that has filled our lives. And so many of us, we recognize this ugliness, don't we? We recognize it in the ugliness around us. We recognize it in the ugliness in our own lives. 
Because we see how creation, how it's broken, and how it has destroyed our lives. How many, how many times have we heard of a friend, or maybe even ourselves, who've lost their lives because of cancer? God's beautiful creation, destroyed because it mutated and changed. How many of us have seen the way that we have abused creation in the sense that the skies at one time were breathable, and now how many people struggle to breathe in the fresh air He gives us? Some of you have had very personal experiences with that ugliness of creation. Growing up, we were mostly a cat family, but we uh, off and on would have dogs as well. When we lived in Texas, we got a dog by the name of Susie, and Susie was a runner. When we adopted her, she had been running and running and running, so much so that she was too tired to keep running. She needed food and she needed water, and so she ended up staying with us. Well, she loved to dart back and forth across our backyard in Texas. She would run back and forth because the squirrels would run across the wire and they would tease her and she'd sprint back and forth and she'd spend hours doing that in the Texas heat, which is sometimes similar to our heat. When we moved to Michigan, Susie was still a very vibrant dog. She still loved to run. We didn't have quite the yard we did and so she learned how she could easily sail over our four-foot chain link fence. Susie could run throughout the neighborhood. The problem was in te- uh, when we moved to Michigan, we lived just two houses off a busy road called Telegraph Road. Telegraph Road was a road that had a speed limit of about 35 miles an hour, but most people drove well over 50, and there was a lot of traffic on that road. Well, one day, the doorbell rang, and Susie, she was ready. She sprinted out the front door, was out on the, on the porch, down the steps and on the sidewalk before we could stop her. Instead of no, what she doing what she normally did and going into the neighborhood, she turned and she went out to the street. Susie wasn't faster than a 50-mile-an-hour car. Thankfully, a gentleman stopped his pickup truck and blocked the lane so we could pick up our dog and bring her back. The vet said she could not be saved. So quickly, this beautiful creation of God, this animal that God had made, was turned ugly. And it's not just our pets. It's not just our forests. It's not just our trees. Throughout our lives and throughout our worlds, we see the way that creation has been destroyed, how sin has wrecked, wreaked havoc throughout our lives in the world. We see the pain that has caused, the brokenness that it's brought in our lives. We see the disgusting side and We've been silenced to it. We've been witnesses to this ugliness, this brokenness. Paul kind of says a little, brings us all together succinctly in Romans chapter 8. He says, For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in pains of childbirth right up to the present time. The the one who subjected it from the very beginning, sin not only had an effect on the lives of people, but it had an effect on the entire creation. When sin entered the world, it brought the entire creation under the same pain and subjugation that we have felt and experienced. And we are waiting. We are waiting for the one to redeem. How can we sing these songs of praise that Psalm 96 encourages us, that the psalmist encourages us to sing? How can we sing these praises and declare, and how can creation declare, when we groan in such pain, when things seem so greatly broken? Because God's salvation is greater. Because the salvation that God has promised us, the salvation that God has given us through His Son, Christ Jesus, is greater. The salvation that He has, although we try to put Jesus into a box, although we try to understand, the salvation He gives us is beyond our comprehension, beyond our knowledge, beyond beyond our, the love that we could ever imagine. And He gives us hope and comfort. It gives us a promise that He is the one who brings the repair to our brokenness and to the brokenness of our creation. He is the one who renews and He is the one who restores. He is the one who picks up this broken life, this 
filthy, ugly, silenced life, the grays and the browns and the blacks of our sinful lives, and he wipes them away with his death on the cross and makes us white as snow again. He is the one who is redeeming creation even now. And it began, well, it began, well, 2,000 years ago. It began with the praise of two rocks, two stones, who praised God. I don't know if you want to go forward or go backwards here, but just a few months ago we went and we celebrated Palm Sunday. And on Palm Sunday, you remember that Jesus said that he sent two disciples to get a donkey and a, the colt of a donkey, and they laid his, their cloaks upon him, the disciples did. And Jesus rode into Jerusalem amidst cheering crowds. They shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The people were excited. Hundreds of people crowded around him, laying palm branches on the ground, preparing for his entry, what we call the triumphant entry. The Pharisees, they didn't care for that, did they? Maybe you remember, because they said, Jesus, you need to stop this right now. Stop these people from praising you. Stop these people from calling you the son of David. And Jesus said, and I always love his response, he said, even if these people are quiet, even if they are silenced, the rocks will cry out. The rocks will cry out. Well, the Pharisees, they got their wish. The people were silenced. Their cheers of shouts of joy were replaced with tears and pain. The sound of mocking as Jesus languished on the cross. But then, in the silence of the people, the rocks cried out. Because on that first Easter morning, as two rocks rolled against one another, you can almost hear the grinding sound as they rolled against one another. They proclaimed the glory of the King. Because that tomb was empty. Because Jesus had risen. Because Jesus had conquered death. He had conquered sin. He had conquered the brokenness of this world. And he had given us a promise of new life, eternal life with him. He had given us the promise that one day we would be restored. And that restoration is already taking place. That restoration is the Lord already working in our world and working in our lives. Why do you think that as we come to the Lord in this Advent season, that we get ready to sing Christmas songs that not only talk about our praise, not only talk about the praise of the angels and the shepherds, they talk about the praise of all creation singing in glory to God. Sure, it doesn't happen how we usually call praise. It's not a, a song that we would sing. But it's when creation does what it's supposed to do. Handles Messiah, joy to the world, countless other songs. Remind us of creation. Not just us praising God, but all of creation. We as God's created being, created unique from all the rest of creation, though God has given us a word to proclaim. A word to proclaim, and we'll have to put it off until after this, but that word is hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord whether you're in church. Sing to the Lord whether you're, it's a Thursday morning or a Tuesday afternoon. Sing to the Lord whether you're sitting on your couch at home or sitting in front of a computer at work. Sing to the Lord. When things are going your way, sing to the Lord when things aren't. But as the creation of God, we have been given that joy, that promise, that one day our King will come again. That even now as we prepare our hearts in this Advent season, we prepare for when our King comes again to make everything new. Now may we praise our Lord and sing to Him our salvation. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord, we thank you for creating this world, for being the creator who is beyond our comprehension, beyond our understanding. We thank you, Lord, for showing us the beauty of your creation. Forgive us for those times when we destroy your creation, when we make it ugly, when we, when we turn our backs on you. Forgive us, O oh Lord, for those times when we, when we indulge in sinful desires instead of indulging in praise to your holy name. Lead us, Lord, to instead honor you. Lead us instead to praise you, whether we be in the church, whether we be in our offices, 
in our cars, or in our homes. Lead us, Lord, to praise you wherever we may be, in whatever circumstances. For we know that even now, we prepare for you, our King, who is coming. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen.